Welcome, welcome, welcome to Office Hours. If you are watching us on YouTube and you want to learn a little bit more about what we do here, head over to officehours.global. And our first hour is typically we're asking, answering questions on media and virtual events. And our second hour is something that we want to spend a little bit more time on. And today we're going to talk about volunteers and volunteer management, whether you're a corporation or nonprofit organization. These people are the lifeline of making sure that you've got a great event. So go ahead, producers, and put those questions into the chat. And if you want to learn more about what we have planned for the week and our schedule, visit officehours.global. Let's get this party started. Thank you, Liberty. Our first one question today comes in from Guy Cochran in Seattle. And Guy says, what was learned from the Zoom backstage webinar testing? And how can it be useful in real world production? Alex? Yeah, so the um, uh, we we did some testing. We build things, and when Zoom Backstage came out, we were kind of in the midst of we have lots of hardware that does this. So there wasn't a lot of interest in Backstage uh, because it was like, okay, well that's cute. We we can already do that in meetings, and we found that the the big problem for us was having multiple being able to have multiple breakout rooms is something we use a lot in our pre production. Um, moving people from one breakout room to another and into um, and then into a show. And so the backstage didn't look that interesting. Um, because of some of the stuff we're doing right now, I wanted to find a kind of like, how do I not have all that hardware involved and just be able to do a show? And I found that webinar without <laughs> backstage was not very good. Uh, the big problems with webinar is that, you know, you kind of have to just start in front of everybody, you know, and get things kind of worked out. It's, it's not a very good experience um, at all. Um, webinar without backstage and backstage is part of the zoom events. I think that I personally think that that's a mistake, but um, so zoom, you have to have a zoom events license to use the backstage as, as opposed to webinar. Um, and I, and I think that the problem with that is that you know, it really would separate Zoom from everything else pretty quickly if backstage is it's something that belongs in in webinar, in my opinion. But we have Zoom events, um, and uh, and where we were using it, and um, the the testing that we did, um, and I just want to thank Guy for the for the help on playing with that. Um, but uh, we we learned that you know it's pretty robust. You know, you can actually um, so basically what happens is you can bring all your panelists into web into the backstage talk to them and what's interesting is you have a split screen and you're able to see the panelists down below if you're you know if, if you're if you're there and then be able to move them and when they once they move in they're into the into the show and one of the things that we played with a little bit is can we have a separate computer have a graphic up have it spotlit and then quietly add the panelists to the back end you know what i don't like is the kind of people coming in a series you know like you see this person then this person then this person then this person so we played a lot with the cadence that would be required. So you could have a computer that's a participant that has, what we were looking at right there specifically was, we wanna have a um, music, messaging, so on and so forth. We wanna open that webinar a half an hour early uh, or that event a half an hour early. So people, and we have you know things that they can just see while they're doing that, we're still in backstage building, you know, talking and figuring things out, making sure everyone's technically ready, you know, all those other things. Then right before the show, we can quietly put the panelists in and the and the viewers won't see that. And figuring that out was a little bit of a cadence to, to, for us to figure out there. Um, and so now we have, um, now we can bring everybody in and then go from a spotlight with, you know, or replace a spotlight, you know, with the host and then start adding the the other panelists in a, in a cadence, which would look a little bit more professional. Um, and so I think that there's, I think that you could actually put together something that's reasonably good uh, within, um, within the webinars. So, so I think that, you know, with using backstage, I think you could put something together that's reasonably good, especially if you start tying it in with Zoom OSC and being able to tie it to a stream deck where you're kind of, and you've rehearsed it a bunch of times of how you're going to do that cadence. I would, I do think that I, I, I want to thank everybody who jumped in. We have about 30, 35, oh, maybe 40 people jump in yesterday morning after office hours. And so we were, we had some people that are all watching, telling us what they're seeing. And then we had other people that were, um, in the, um, in the in the as panelists and we just kind of push things around to figure out what was what was working and what wasn't working we did find if you um if you do replace spotlight with somebody it does remove everybody's spotlights <laughs> so it just pops that in that actually is a feature because if you at the end of the show if you want to do just a close out and say thank you for watching you can just hit replace spotlight and now everybody's been pushed off the off the uh the screen there so so i think that there was some some interesting opportunities as far as figuring out 
you know, how to make all of that work um, and, and when can we see everybody and when can we not see folks. Um, so, so I think that those, you know, it's, it's a pretty interesting puzzle in, in backstage. You can hear the show, turn the show up a little bit. I do think that we could probably, um, as was mentioned before, that, that second ear experience that we've been playing with could probably be done pretty easily with the, um, with, with this process. And so, so we're going to kind of take a look at that as well. So anyway, so I think that, it, you know, I don't think that we would replace what office hours or what own I know does you know, with, with uh, zoom. I think our hardware still didn't make me feel like I, I miss my hardware, but, um, I do want to, wanted to find a lighter, uh, way to do these, uh, you know, for some, some of the projects that we're working on. And I think that it's a, it's a pretty valid way to, to do it for, again, if I was doing it as a service for a client, I would still absolutely use the hardware that I have. <laughs> if I was uh, doing it for myself or a smaller, you know, thing that we're just trying to get off the ground, um, then I would. Uh, I, I think that the that the the, web, the backstage and the the, the webinar via events um, makes sense. And just jumping in for a second, when you say like it would be good for a second ear experience, how do you see well, that? When, what, one of the things that we did for um, the last dub, for Dub Dub, the keynote, which, you know, different people have different opinions of how well that worked. But we, you know, if we stream to YouTube, um, if we stream to YouTube, we, we don't want to break the terms of service, which means we don't want to actually stream the event. Um, and I don't know whether that made sense or not. I'll be honest. I, I think that the next keynote will probably go back to after hours and then we're probably going to experiment with doing whatever we want to do because we don't have to worry about it. Um, but, but if we, um, uh, but what was nice about it for the panelists was we could, we, what we did is we piped the, the keynote into our ears and then put on a window that we saw the keynote. We didn't broadcast that out. That way we didn't violate any terms of service, but we could comment about it. With this, we could theoretically put it into the main screen, have all the panelists watch it from the backstage, use Zoom OSC to just grab onto the back, you know, just jump into the I, Zoom ISO and Zoom OSC, jump into the back end and, you know, just grab us from there, right? So that we're all being pushed out there, but we see a big screen of the, and, and we can turn up our volume up and down as needed all through Zoom without using Unity as a, as a separate piece. Um, so that, I thought that was kind of an interesting, um, possibility, you know, in that, in that area. So, so, you know, it's just another way that we could potentially do, do what we're doing. So, so I think that it's going to be, um, so I, I, anyway, I get, again, I think that if you're a small company or you're a medium sized company that's just trying to get something off the ground, I think that the zoom webinar and events with, with the backstage, um, I think makes sense. Again, I would, um, as soon as I wanted to do something with a little bit more pizzazz, <laughs> I'd almost immediately um, move over. I mean, I, one of the things I'm trying to think about is how to use, be more effective at using the, the vanilla version of Zoom and then what's the next step from there and what's the next step from there. So for me, it's, it's basically like you have vanilla and then you have, um, you know, you've got a, what I think is going to end up being kind of a, a, either a couple Mac minis or a, or one or two studios and they go into an ATEM and that's another kind of show. And then you have the next step up would probably be what, what own I know does with individuals, you know, going into that. And then the office hours 2.0 is pretty much the, the, the state of the art, I think in, in what, because it allows the low latency graphics, all the other bits and pieces of what we're doing. So um, anyway, that's, but I'm trying to make sure that I understand how all four of those iterations actually work. Jesse? Uh, yeah, I guess one of the biggest pieces about the new backstage feature is that panelists and um, and such and, and other crew members can monitor the main feed from the program. So um, as Alex has mentioned, you know, uh, a simpler way to basically send a return feed to those folks and, uh, you know, not as customizable as if you were to send a uh, customized or individualized even uh, return feed to those individuals. Uh, but yeah, quite easy to to monitor what's happening in the main room uh, versus, you know, having a breakout room or a second meeting as a lot of folks are doing nowadays and uh, keeping the folks there and then shuffling them over to the main session. So simplifies that work workflow a bit. Nice. And Mitchell? Would it make any sense to take a feature in Backstage and if you didn't want to use it, replicate that on your 090 hardware? Uh, I, I don't, yeah, we do so much more in 
what we do in the 090 hardware that I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't use anything from backstage to do that because I've got individual talk back for each person. I've got individual returns for each person. So I can send back, every person can see something different. So oftentimes we can give them splits, super sources, all kinds of other things on the returns. So our, the, the, yeah, it, it, it's hard to say which is more advanced to what 090 does and what Office Hours 2.0 does. Um, we do it in a very way that's very comfortable. We're still limited a little bit in, you know, isolated audio and isolated, you know, you know, the kind of returns we can send back um, compared to what we do with the bigger hardware. Um, the big, the, the big drawback with the larger hardware is just the latency. So, so, you know, that's the, that's the piece that, that we're still challenged with. But, um, but so, and I, and I do think that makes a difference. I and mean, that's why I like to do it with, with 2.0. But I, I do think that um, there's nothing, there's nothing about backstage other than it's vanilla and it's easy to use. Uh, I mean, you know, it's, there's nothing about it that would want me to use any of that as opposed to the hardware that we have. Next question. Who's reading? Oh, I am sorry. I got, I, I got lost he there for a so moment. He was so enamored with, uh, <laughs> He's thinking with, about, with the he was so into backstage. He was just like, right. oh my, huh. he, Bill's, Bill's thinking of all the shows in front of him. Yeah. Right. It's all, it's, it's so hard to, I, it, I, you know, cause this is fascinating. So, the, the one thing that I will say is that I think that one of the reasons that I wanted to learn a little bit more about it and, and use one of our newer shows as a test for this is that it shouldn't stop people and feel like you have to have all this hardware to be able to do, start doing events online. And so, so I think it's, I think that what, what Zoom has done is really effective. I I think that um, I think backstage is actually pretty useful. I think that it's a I think it's a huge mistake for them to hold it up inside of um, a, a vertical instead of making it available to everyone that has webinars because it would just mean that a lot more people would use webinars. the The big thing that I don't think that Zoom really gets completely is when someone looks foolish on an online event, they never want to do that event again. Like, like, you know, and so the thing is, is that backstage is a huge tool to keeping executives from looking silly at the beginning of an event, because when that C-level person gets on and, and, and has this uncomfortable moment in front of, you know, 300 employees or 500 employees or a thousand employees, they're like, okay, let's go back to, to, to in-person, <laughs> like, like, let's not do this again. You know, and that's the mistake that Zoom's making is, is that they maybe are making a little extra money by pushing people into events, but they're literally cutting their nose off to spite their face. So I think it's a great feature um, and it's poorly executed um, because of that issue. All right, Bill. Okay, now I'm back into the flow of things here. Uh, so the, the the reason it messed me up is I saw my name. TJ Asher, Minneapolis says, will Bill Davis be willing to share how he edited the original The Remote's Office Hours band video? I can only imagine the complexity of the timeline with so many different sources. Would that be a second hour or better as a lab in after hours? Go ahead, Bill. Uh, sure, absolutely. Tell me where I need to be and when. It was fun doing that. It was an interesting process. It was our first music video that we had attempted, and uh, there were a lot of challenges, uh, and I just found the process interesting. So, yeah, I'd be happy to talk through it anytime anybody wants to. Next question. Next question moving along is from Deborah Woodfork in Washington, D.C. Anyone check out the stream or in-person experience for the Somethings in the Water concert in D.C. and have any thoughts about it? Go ahead, Alex. I, I, I didn't. I, I checked it out when I looked at this website, and then of course that took me to Twitch, and of course Twitch doesn't keep the that didn't didn't keep any of the uh, the videos, so I haven't been able to see it. Uh, I think that that's usually a, a problem. It's problematic when people decide to do music concerts and then not keep the videos up, and that's a it's kind of an old music style approach. Is that you know they want to charge one thing for the live show and a lot more for the for the the but the problem is is that they just don't get any reach. You know, so 90, 95% of the potential viewers that might be interested in that band uh, no longer uh, get to see the, the, the video. So, um, so it, it's, I, I don't know how, how it turned out, <laughs> but uh, maybe it was great. So, but, and I think that that's the problem is that you don't, you don't build that up. And that's, a, it's, it, again, I think that at some point the, the music industry will realize that generating followings that, that then stream stuff from Spotify and everything else is, is the way to generate more revenue, not because the companies just can't, aren't going to, even at, at, at whatever scale, when you look at that many artists, they're not going to make it a, a bigger deal than they're already paying for the bands, which is not insignificant. The bands are usually paid a lot of money to show up live. Like it's not like they're not getting paid. So, um, but they're, they're losing an opportunity to, to expand further. 
Yeah, and Deborah, if you want to share in the comments what you thought about him, yeah. and then it looks know, great. Yeah. If I had known that it was there, we, we should definitely try to start building a calendar of these kinds of things because I would have definitely watched over this weekend if I had known it was there. Next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next. He says, would the DJI Mini 3 Pro, and he's got the link there, be a solid choice as a first drone? I know the standard recommendation is cheap drones first, but the safety features and 4K camera of the Mini are very attractive. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I would go, these days, I would go uh, uh, with a cheap drone first, only if you're trying to learn how to fly a first person uh you know, on camera, flying it off of the camera image only because the, the drones like the DJI Mini 3 Pro and I have the DJI Mini, um, the first one, is under 250 grams. So there's less hoops to jump through as far as registration and uh, rules and regulations. There are some rules you still have to obey about the height that you can fly it, fly it within, you know, line of sight. But um the stability of the thing is amazing. And this new one, the 3 Pro, has uh, uh, triple direction or three direction, three axis uh, collision avoidance. So it can actually fly around trees instead of directly into them, uh, which is a common mistake with many new drone pilots. Uh, they get fascinated with that, that uh, first person view and don't realize that there's something behind them when they try and back up or something to the side when they turn and speed off in the, in the other direction but it's amazingly i i'm i took my original mini up and it i can bring it up inside the living room here and take my hands off the controls and it'll just sit there and it has no gps inside so it actually uh, uses the cameras to determine its height above the ground when you're indoors and uh, uses gps when you're outdoors and can do a perfectly stable shot that you from that uh, 4k camera or 2.5k camera in the first one that looks just like you built a platform that was 250 feet tall and set a camera on it. So, yeah, I think it's a great first person. I mean, first drone for a, a learning. Jason? It's hard to add much to that. A very good friend of mine owns the Drone U, which is a drone instruction school. He has something called the Don't Crash course, which will teach you very quickly you know, simple things like take off into the wind, how to calibrate it, calibrate it every single time, be sure you get the compass right. These are really the most important things. As far as the the, the Mini 3, um, there are a few limitations that I don't love. You can't shoot 4K HDR and over 30 FPS. But, uh, you know, again, the first part is to learn how to fly. And if you're willing to learn how to fly carefully, then go for it. Guy? Yeah, I'd also recommend the DJI Mini 3 Pro. That one, um, not having to register it um, is, is a huge boon. I, I live in a flight path of, of an air airport, and so I haven't been able to fly mine anymore, especially after going to uh, Douglas Spotted Eagle's uh, course at uh, Photo Plus, and he put the fear of God in me with jail time and fines and things like that. So I haven't flown since, I, and I own a Mavic and a Spark, but shelved them after that, and I even bought the command center so I can go ultra long range and uh, yeah, shelved it. Mitchell? Uh, Douglas, I don't think the safety features trumps pilot error. So still, uh, spend a little bit of money on a small one that's expendable just to get your feet wet. And Courtney? Yeah, it's reasonably priced, but you got to remember uh, they do offer accessories for it, like a bigger battery that'll give you a little bit longer flight time. But if you add that bigger battery, it puts it over 250 grams and then you have to register it. So if you're thinking about adding accessories for it, like the uh, prop protectors or the uh, extra battery, bear in mind that it you, throws you into another class of drone. Yeah, and I'll just add, I remember when I first, um, all of like what Guy said, the fear of God <laughs> of like, am I going to crash? Because you watch all these videos and hearing and seeing how people, you know, people end up crashing. And the thing is, you've just got to like go out there and, and do. And like um, Jason said, it's about flying and remembering the safety parts. So more focus on the, the pilot, you the pilot, than the actual, the actual drone. Next question. Next question comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. He says, what NLE or other software can correct for the lens distortion in footage sourced from a GoPro or similar camera? Jason. Well, Final Cut Pro has a list of cameras and lenses that if it knows, it will correct for. But I have always used um, 
Alex 4D Golner's plugin, which is just the wide angle correction plugin. And it's what I've always used and it works beautifully. And Mitchell? Yeah, if you're working inside Adobe World, then all of the plugins, third party plugins out there, um, I think that the Red Giant uh, Maxon has uh, some lens correction and then maybe a Boris one also. So they would work with uh, Premiere or After Effects if you were, uh, you know, trying to correct for that problem. You can go ahead, Alex. Yeah, and, and for basic correction where you just want to just pull out some of the, the, the pin cushion kind of effect, then a lot of these plugins will work. If you're looking at an actual, this is how it's done. It's usually done in Nuke. <laughs> so those are, and, and um, the way that that's actually um, produced for film is that there is a distortion chart that is put up and the camera, it's usually just a big checkerboard, but they ha oftentimes they have other pieces of it put into it. And if you go way back, I don't even know if we broadcasted those. Uh, Chris, uh, Chris Summers uh, showed some of those that basically you shoot this, um, uh, you, you shoot this distortion box that measures that. And then you're able to build a file that says, this is what the distortion is of this lens on this sensor. Then you can keep on applying it to, to all the shots. And that's going to um, allow you to get a much better solution than what you would get from the plugins. And Mickey in the chat says to Douglas, smoke, flame, nuke, and resolve. So there it is. I haven't done it in resolve. I, I, I'll have to look at that. I, I, I have to, that might be a good second hour of, of removing distortion within resolve. The other ones are pretty expensive. <laughs> Douglas, go ahead and put that in Discord in yeah, the exactly. second hours for exactly. us. So we can vote that up, please. See if we can't collect some folks. All right, next question. Next one comes to us from Mitch Hill in Wilmington, Delaware, here on the panel. How far do we still have to go for real faces in CGI? Alex? Probably a long way. So I think that we we all hope to get to it. I mean, there's, there's some stuff, but to really get to uh, realistic faces, it was easier to do something like Gollum because it didn't look exactly like us. When it starts to look exactly like us, and especially when it starts to look like someone we know, so when you look at Princess Leia or those types of things, we, we know what that should look like. And the problem that we really get into is that as human beings, our survival, our success in life comes with our ability to read someone's face. And so we... Um, when very, very small details, like, you know, mean a lot to us. If I raise my eyebrow just a little bit and not even that much, but just a, just a little, little, just a, just a twitch, you're going to notice that. And you're going to think that that means something. And so you're used to paying attention to it, that detail. And we're not quite getting that resolution. Um, and, and, and when we watch cartoons, it doesn't matter to us because we're not expecting that. But as soon as we get to what we call the uncanny valley, which is this it looks so close that it's almost there. We, our brain stops thinking about it as something different and so it starts wanting it to be real. And then it becomes frustrated that it's not. And so, so I think that that's gonna be a challenge probably for another decade. Um, you know, maybe within five years, maybe. You know, I, I give it 20% chance. I'd give it 80% chance in 10 years and 100% chance that we'll have something that we're pretty sure is, but we think that is real in, in, within 15 years. But, but, but that uncanny valley is deep, wide <laughs> mitchell i love that term uncanny valley yeah. it seems like only it only takes one thing to throw mm -hmm. you whether it's the way they hold themselves or the motion or mm -hmm. then have those micro tremors or movements that people have yeah. in the I, body I, language i mean the ai stuff is, is doing better than the cg stuff you know the ai stuff yeah. is definitely you know when it's when it's but it's pixel it's pixel pushing and it has ton like what you see when you see the AI stuff it takes an enormous amount of compositing and they're cutting around a lot of things um, because, and, and the person's face has to be very close to it. There's a bunch of things that have to happen for it to really work. So um, that's the that's the challenge. Yeah, I always notice uh, the translucency. The skin is just really hard to get because it re has the reflectance and a translucency mm -hmm. and an absorption. It just, you know, the fake faces just always have that. Yeah, it's a hard thing to fix. Look. Yeah. yeah. And Courtney? Yeah, I was going to mention the deep fakes uh, because the deep fakes, if you start with uh, uh, an actor or some person with, you know, uh, that the deep fake can use for guiding its, uh, you know, eye contact and its reactions, facial reactions, it looks pretty real. Look for Collider deep fake roundtable and you'll see, uh, you know, some amazing uh, stuff. I thought you had Pac-Man going on. <laughs> he can talk and play Pac-Man at the same time. 
<laughs> Next question. <laughs> Next one comes from Simon Ray in Shrewsbury in the UK. Says, in photogrammetry, is it acceptable to take pictures of an object on a turntable with a camera in a static position? Or must the object be static and only the camera move in order to keep the lighting of the object as consistent as possible? Alex? It depends on whether you have dramatic lighting or or, saw, or kind of generalized lighting. So most things that are captured as a model are on turntables that uh, are moving and the camera stays stationary because moving the camera is a pain. Um, so so it definitely can be done. The main thing is, is you need large sources of light and you need to be able to create a generalized background, you know, generalized lighting so that it doesn't change. It's just really, you're trying to get down to what we would call the ambient occlusion. So you're, it's only just showing things getting a little darker around the edges, but you're not getting directional light of any of any sort. Um, so, and and then you can actually get pretty good at it. Once, you know, you can do it by hand. Uh, you can also use motorized uh, ones. I have a little one here that I'm just starting to play with. This is uh, this is one that I haven't, haven't put into action yet, but I'm playing with, I think it's called a, oh, it's a this is the Skype or the, um, or the, oh, can't read it. They made it so subtle. The genie. Um, this is this little guy. So this is a little one, and you can put a platform on top of it, and then program it to go around and put your object on it. And so you can definitely do that. Um, uh, you can make that 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 work as long as you have big soft lighting, and that's the way most people do it. The big problem you get into is going up and over. So what um, some of these rigs have is five or six cameras that start at the top and go down every so many angles. That way you only have to do one rotation and you get all the rows um, at one time. Um, that's, that's a way to kind of speed things up a little bit and make it, the, the, the big problem with photogrammetry of objects is the more time between each photo or the, the t time you start taking the photos and the end of the photo, the more, the more opportunities for things to be different and making it harder. So you want to capture as much as possible. Like a lot of the light, big ones that professionals use, I mean, the, the big, not professionals, professionals use all kinds of ones, but the ones that film use uh, oftentimes are huge domes that take all the photos at one time or even video at one time. Jason? Alex completely got it. Um, I was basically going to say that in a perfect world, the pictures would all be taken simultaneously and, you know, at a completely um, predetermined distance and yeah, it, and absolutely simultaneously is the best way to do this. So however you can do that, turntable, you know, whole big long bar, um, grid of, of cameras, however you can do that, that's, that is the ideal. Next question. Kenneth Jones in Seattle, Washington is up next in the ever never ending search for the best headphones at the least price. Which item also has the largest ear cups looking for all day wear that doesn't crush my cartilage? Jason? Sure, I've got a couple for you. The um, AKG K240s are um, excellent. They weigh 100 grams and they you really can wear them all day. They're um, semi opened. Um, let's see, I pulled these out of the studio. These are the Bayer Dynamic DT990 Pros. These are another kind of classic big can, you know, large, large can. Um, those are the two that I can think of. I, I'm pretty sure the AKGs cost a lot less. Jesse? <clears throat> Jesse, sorry. Yeah, um, I'm also a fan of the Bayer Dynamics. I have way too many headphones, but they're a uh, nice thing about those uh, anything in the dt series they have a uh, metal band on them they have really nice uh, sort of velour uh cushiony ear cups and uh yeah you can wear those all day they're fairly neutral sounding let's see what bill has to say my leading source of authority for this has always been college humor here you go just something simple that will not <laughs> mess your cartilage at all wow a <laughs> guy yeah, I like the HD, the Sennheiser HD 25 1 2s. They have the flip up earpiece. So if you do want to be able to hear what else is going on in the world, you can just flip that up pretty quick. Uh, as far as comfort, these new ones from Rode, the NTH 100s, these are about uh, 149 bucks. Super, super soft cushions. Uh, they're like a gel filled cushion with a velour. And then they've got the Alcantara on them. So the, those are. Uh, becoming my favorite. I'm I'm not a huge fan of the sound yet. It takes some getting used to. If you're used to the 7506s, which is also what I wear. If you do get the 7506s, you want to um, get the Garfield um, slipovers because eventually those things start breaking apart and and uh, 
they just make a mess everywhere. The other ones I like are the Apple AirPod Maxes because you can enable transparency. And with transparency mode, I remember you kind of saying that you had some concerns about people sneaking up behind you. Uh, you can either do noise cancellation with one button press or you press it again, and that enables transparency, which it, you can hear what else is going on. So the microphones uh, let you hear the room. So those are a couple options. Those are the most expensive ones, about 549 Mitchell? I agree with the guy on the 7506 that there are broadcast standards from Sony. Uh, they store easily like that. Uh, the foam does uh, deteriorate after about one or two years. Uh, Sky, if you've seen him, has a pair of these with a uh, teal blue uh, pad that he's replaced them with, and they tend to be a little softer on the ears. But I've used these for ages in, in broadcasting, and I still have my ears, so it must be working. And John? If you want to be like everybody, you get the 7506 Sonys. But if you want to be special like Tucker and I, you get Ultra Zones. And the thing is, is that the cups fit over the top of the ear so they don't put any pressure on the earlobe. Okay, next question. Next one comes to us from Jesse Mills in the San Francisco Bay Area and here on the panel. Has anyone used an SEDI LUT box for color correction like the AJA LUT box or similar? And if so, how well do they work? Jason? They work well. It simply depends on uh, the quality of the LUT that you are putting into them. I mean, that's that's the long and the short of it. And Alex? Yeah, so so with LUTs, the the main thing is is that they um, it really uh, they're pretty simple math, <laughs> you know. So it's not it's not that there's a lot of processing going on. This is this is what we call pixel math. So there's um, the things you have to worry about are convolution kernels. So think you know where you need processing, where it needs to pay attention to the pixels around it. So that's a blur or a sharpen or those kinds of things are actually affecting the image around it. Um, when you're just changing the color of a pixel. Uh, it is a, the pixel math is very, very simple. And so most of these boxes will do exactly the same thing, no matter what you actually put into them, because all they're doing is transforming the color, the RGB, and, and they're just given a, a transform direction. So, you know, the main, the main thing that you have to understand about LUTs is that it is a, it is not a color correction to something. It is a conversion from one thing to another. It says, Every time I, you know, I don't know what is coming in, but I'm going to assume that it's P3 or it's 709 or it's, or it's, uh, you know, it is um, uh, Rec 2020, whatever that is, it's going to come in and I'm assuming that this is where it, what's coming in. And what I want you to do is I want to move these pixel values from here to here and from here to here. Now, the reason we call these, the LUTs are called cube files because it really is a cube. RGB is XYZ. I don't know if it's XYZ. You know, I don't know <laughs> the RGB, but I think it's, it's, it's those three channels. And basically it's taking, it's just like a curve that you'd have instead of the, um, you know, the curve that you, you have like this. Well, when you're looking at Photoshop, um, what you have is, you know, this and this is the value goes in and the value goes out. Here and, and when it's perfectly straight, that means that the value is for any given value, then the value stays exactly the same. But if I curve this up like this, so if you want to make it a little brighter in there, what it says is the value is coming in here, but I want you to actually go out here. So it came in at, at the same value, but now it's brighter. And that's 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 how a curve works when you're when you're making that adjustment. A cube file is doing this in three dimensions. So this is just one dimensional. It's on the overall view or it's on the R, G, or B. Um, all, the only thing that, that the cube file does, it just does that in every dimension at the same time. So it's simply taking that point and moving in. And, and so um, all of these LUT boxes work. If the, 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 the challenge people get into is not that the LUT boxes don't work, it's that they... Um, they don't understand how the LUTs work. <laughs> so they, the problem they have is, is they don't understand that it, every LUT has to be, it is a lookup table and it is going from this to this. It's going from a very specific source to a very specific output. So for instance, log from a Sony and log from a Blackmagic and a log from something else are all different. They're all different starting points, but that LUT is the same. It's the same conversion for each one of those. So you have to have a lookup table for every, any specific conversion that you want to make from and to. Um, and so, but as far as matching cameras, I think it's, it, it's what's great about these LUT boxes is that you can match any camera to any other camera w as close as you possibly could. In the past, we were very limited to, we can only paint the cameras. You know, we can only paint the cameras so well. So what would happen is if you're using a GoPro or you're using some kind of little webcam or something's in there, if any, a little PTZ camera, you were limited to 
that camera ruled what all the color would look like because you had to paint everything to the lowest common denominator, you know, because the other ones that had more tools just gave you be a better way to get to those because those couldn't get to where they were. The LUT means that you take that, that raw video signal, you run it through this little box. And what you need to do is take that video, you push it through the, push it through the box so that you have a state, right? And then you take it into Resolve, just take a video of that in Resolve, preferably with a chart. But you basically then color correct it the way you want it color correct one camera so that it looks perfect. Then you take each camera and you run it through that, through there and you go into resolve and you basically take the chart. This is the way I do it. I mean, Charles does it much faster and better than I do, but I'm the less sophisticated version of it is that I take the chart and I, the second chart for the second camera, I put it over top of the first camera. The first camera is still there in, in resolve. I set that one to difference and I corner pin it until it, until all the features match mostly the colors match. Then I start going, then I go into my color correction and I go into LUT and I'll correct it until it turns black. When it turns black, it means that they, these, these two cameras are exactly the same. I then save that out as a cube file. I put that into the, into the LUT box and then I review it. I, I literally take it back out again and put it raw over top of it again to make sure that I did it right. <laughs> so, so, you know, trust, but verify. Um, and so, so then you, um, so then I do that again. Now that takes a time, that takes time. It probably take, you know, Charles can do all of the cameras. He does them for me occasionally for these things. And Charles can do all the cameras in like 30 minutes. I take four hours. <laughs> so, so, but you know, so, so, so it's, so it, it, it takes me much longer. Take like eight cameras will take me four hours. It'll take me half an hour per camera to, to, to do this process, um, to do it as well. Um, and, and inside of, you have all kinds of power inside of the, um, inside of Resolve to do these. Uh, the, I will say that Resolve Pro does have some advantages with the warper and so on and so forth to really get things just the way you want them. Um, and it's worth the 300 bucks <laughs> to have the extra tools because what, the, what Resolve does is you have all these filters that you're doing and it concatenates that, that correction all the way down to just a, change the pixels this much, you know? And so, so it's a really, um, anyway, I would, I, uh, it's, it's a good technique. It takes time, but you can correct any camera to any other camera as well as it can. The camera science is always going to be a little different, but for a lot, you know, good enough for government work uh, or most of our live work, um, you can absolutely get all of the cameras into the same rodeo pretty, pretty easily. Nice. Jason. Well, Alex implied this, but I, I wanted to make it a, a little bit clearer. So, you know, you've got your X, Y um, and your standard color chart. And the third dimension, the Z axis, I believe, is is the luminance value. Is that correct, Alex? Uh, no, it's RGB. <laughs> so it's 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 the uh, the the each axis on the cube is RGB. You know, so it's it's X, Y. It's an X, Y, Z transform for the for that. Otherwise, I'm it dead wrong. Ah, I'm pretty. I'm pr or I'm dead wrong, but I'm, I'm almost certain <laughs> RGB is the three axes that you're that you're affecting. When you do it in, in when you do luminance in Photoshop, for instance, to pull it up, it just automatically transfers those to all the. It is doing a cube at that point. It's moving all of them at the same time in Unity. And Mitchell, I would have to ask after seeing this: uh, Is the AJ LUT box the best? Are there better ones out there? Are they? Uh, is there a recommendation yeah. from anybody? I have not seen any difference between any light box other than the only thing that they will have is being able to handle more points. And I don't know what the AJA one is. There's multiple sets of points. So the number of points that you have, the more the more granularity you can make adjustments. Uh, everybody handles a 33 point cube. And then if, as they go into the 60s and above, they you may or may not be able to be able to process it. So that's the thing that uh, you want to look at is how large a cube you can put into it. And I haven't used the AJA one. We've been using the Black Magic ones. I We do use the LUTs with the, um, uh, the FSs, the FSs, or the FS HDRs have LUTs so that you, that you can apply. And so we've used them there uh, successfully. Next question. JJ McKenna in Santa Venetia, California, up next with the Office Hours 2.0 infrastructure was set up for Cinegear with breakout rooms and graphics in a separate room other than the panel. Wouldn't this satisfy the desired need that the Sunday experiment might have offered? Alex. Yeah, the, the goal there was to not use extra hardware or extra software. The idea was to use a, the goal for the Sunday experiment was to do nothing except for uh, what we, uh, what the vanilla item can use. So um, that was, that's what we were trying to work inside of. And so it, it, I think it worked well 
for that. Again, I think that it's getting buried because of um, the way it's being marketed, but but I think that it's a great it's a great feature as a vanilla tool. Next question. Chris Taylor in Carlsbad, California says, Alex, can you do an after hours lab on how you set up backstage? Yeah, Alex. absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll figure that out. Not this week, but let's, we'll, we'll look in, you know, in a, uh, maybe a week or two out and uh, see if we can't build something out or we'll just do again what we did. Uh, you know, it was r- really great. Uh, we'll schedule it so you know ahead of time that we're going to do it. Um, and then what we probably should do is have, s- the hard part is to be able to show you what we see as that's the part where I think we have to figure out is uh, we'll do it where we have some, a bunch of people join the meeting and then other people watching. But I think we have to figure out a way for people to, it's hard to be in the webinar to see what's happening. Maybe we'll just have a handful of people in the webinar as use cases and then a handful of, it was useful. The hard part was it was very useful for us to have nine, more than nine people as panelists because we were able to test pinning all nine and what is the behavior of what happens with the 10th <laughs> because you can't pan it. Um, so those are the things that, uh, that, that are, that are um, still working out. But yeah, we, we can absolutely do that. Because I was listening and I was like, oh, I can't stay for this. <laughs> well, it, it, I felt almost embarrassed by doing it because I was like, I, I don't, you know, this has been around for a long time. And so I was embarrassed that you know, the, the, the backstage, some version of backstage or, or pre-show or whatever has been around, I think for a while. And so I was, I was a little embarrassed that I, that I didn't know how to use it at all. And then I was less embarrassed when I found out that it wasn't part of the vanilla uh, webinar. It was part of something else that I didn't have access to. So, um, so the, so I think that it was, um, yeah. So I, I think that, uh, but a lot of people won't know it's there because it's not in the, vanilla webinar. <laughs> that's the, that's the, I think that's the right. challenge. It's a lot of a lot of engineering resources going nowhere. So. And, and to your point, it makes sense too of using something like keeping it simple. You're not always going to have those shows where it is like using all this gear, just knowing here's our minimal viable one and yeah. how to use it. So. And and it's also, you know, I think that it's, it's a backup, you know, to the gears. So I felt like one of the reasons that it showed up for me was I want to know that if I don't have my hardware, I can still produce a show that is, um, you know, M- a minimal viable project product and MVP. So that you know, you get to a situation and suddenly your gear isn't working. You don't right. want to tell the client they can't do a show at all or have something be just, you know, uh, a tra- you know, uh, you know, dumpster fire. So, so knowing how to use this tool effectively, I think suddenly popped into my mind, like this is pretty important for me to know. So you'll see us, you know, as we do some of the podcast stuff that we're doing, you'll see us um, using that. And it's mostly because I, I want to become facile with it. And I'll probably, nice. first step is to do that. Next step is to try to figure out how to tie my stream deck into it. And you know, like all of those things to, to really make it a, make it a really good show. Awesome. Next question. Next one comes to us from our friend Tony Mobley, doing in Georgia. One of my Father's Day gifts was an Amazon card for $50. How should I spend it, office hours panelists? That's a dangerous question, Tony. Go ahead, Bill. Well, it is a dangerous question, and I'm going to have trouble answering it for you, not for anybody else on the panel, but for you. Because what I do if I get a gift card in that zone is I try not to spend it on a thing. I try to take somebody that I'm interested in getting to know a little bit more about out for a cup of coffee. I'd rather have an interaction with a human being. Now, you, Tony, are a disaster for that because you have conversations with Tony Mobley and have this set up system for meeting interesting people and discussing things with them that is, I think, magical and fabulous. Uh, but that's what I do with them. I do that. The other thing I do is put them in a, in a drawer occasionally and use them as what I call a guilt reducer, which is that if I do want to buy a little something and I'm my wife is saying, you sure you need that? I go, oh, I have a gift card right here. It doesn't cost anything. It's just a free ride. So those are my strategies for small gift cards. That's smart, smart. John? 50 bucks to buy you a pretty good ribeye steak there, Tone. That's what I would buy. Yeah, good eating. And Alex, the key is to argue that it's not that it didn't cost anything; it just didn't cost as much. Yeah, you know, that, 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 that's the key. It's 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 like it's like half off sale. Um, the one thing that I would look at that I'm I'm pretty happy with, that I think, is a little bit more than that. But I but I given Tony that you use the the phones, this these small rig. Um, if you don't have one already, these small rig um, little uh, cases or or rig, you know, um, ex, exo, ectoskeletons uh, for the cameras are super useful. Um, and I'd, I'd look at, look at that. And Tony. 
Yeah, so it's it's an actual Amazon card. So I have to spend it with Amazon. But I did get uh, $30 cash to go with it. So I would I would pull all that together. So that that's why I asked the and, question. Yeah, this, that small rig that I was talking about is is $66, it looks like, on, on Amazon. So, I see so you've got it would some be, change left over there, Tony. See, see, there you go. <laughs> Next question. Eduardo Augustine in Panama is back with us. And this time he asks, since we were talking about the DJI drones, how can I output the video from a drone live to a video switcher like the ATEM or ATEM Mini? Go ahead, Jason. I'm aware of one way to do this, and it is with a Crystal Sky very, very expensive um, LCD screen. Um, there are you, you will find people on YouTube who will tell you, oh, yeah, it's no, you know, no problem. Get an iPad and put it in through USB-C. No, the only way to really get it is with a crystal sky. Is there what's the difference between those that are hacking it through the iPad and the, the sky? Is it that it flakes or? No, think, uh, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, you, you just don't get, I don't think, I think it's basically kind of like a screen scrape. You know, it's not oh, okay, a, got it. it's not a true it's video output true. other than got Crystal it. Sky, yeah. All right. And John? I thought the DJI Smart Controller has HDMI out, and that's how we, we use those at the rocket shoot. Those were live footage directly out of the Smart Controllers into our video switcher. The um, i1 might be able to do it. I don't remember. Do you yeah, know which, Chris which controller? Chris says the DJI yeah. smart controller, but only some drones give clean HDMI. Courtney? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Uh, the, I don't think the Mini does uh, give you clean HDMI. Uh, you can always try. I don't know if you could try it, but uh, if you have an iPhone, you could maybe play it, uh, you know, airplay it to your apple tv i don't know if that it wouldn't be clean hdmi out but you could get the screen from dji fly which has the overlays it shows you all the uh flight information you can turn off the ones that you're not using yeah that that's the other problem that you're going to run into is you're if you screen scrape you're going to end up with telemetry data with all of the hud stuff um directly you know on your on your frame and you would have to push in to get it right and and because of the, because they're trying to go for the lowest latency, the the image that comes back from the drone to the controller is not full resolution because they want to give it to you as fast as you can so that you can control the you know eye, eye line control of that drone. You don't want to see that tree three seconds after you hit it. Right. <laughs> Next question. TJ Asher in Minneapolis, Minnesota says, I have my vacation video finished and I want to share this with 10 friends who are on the trip. It has non-licensed commercial music. Is there any free way to share this online so that only those 10 can see this without getting copyright strikes? Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that Vimeo would work. You can get the free account of Vimeo and upload it and make it available to them. And I don't think that that I think that would be a relatively easy way to do that. Courtney? That's one way, or if you have uh, iCloud or Google Drive, just uh, transfer it up there to the cloud and right-click on that file and set, save a link, and then you just send that link to all your 10 friends, and they can click on it and view it at their leisure. And it never goes public. It's never exposed to anyone, and uh, they can watch your videos. Go ahead, Bill. Just amplifying what Alex says, uh, Vimeo has private and public, and so just make sure you you – Click on the private button, send the link just to your friends and nobody else, and you shouldn't get in any trouble at all. And Jason. Um, I just, I had to check this. Frame.io, as long as you can get your video under two gigabytes, I think um, you can use the free account. All right, next question. Douglas Carmichael says, how would you power a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera, for example, from a moving vehicle like an aircraft or car? Could you connect it to the vehicle's power system or would you have to rely on its batteries? Douglas, you ask like the best questions, <laughs> guy. Yeah, you'd probably use uh, either the extended battery grip or this is a cheese plate from Headbox. So you get all the mountain, mounting points. So if you wanted to secure that inside of a, a plane, because a lot of times you won't be able to start and stop record. So it's just you, you start it and you just let it roll. So this is a V-mount uh, plate that can go on rails. Again, it's made by Headbox. And then it also has a D-tap connector. So uh, I carry this one with me, which is specifically for the Blackmagic Cinema Cam with that two-pin prong. I also carry a D-tap to that same two-pin. I don't know if that's a limo or not, but it's, it's a specific to the Blackmagic and those are two power options for that specific camera. Go ahead, Alex. 
Yeah, a, a lot of vehicles are going to have some version of, a, of an inverter, so you can just use their power cable and just plug it in. Uh, you can buy these inverters for not very much money that you can plug into a, a cigarette lighter um, or, or other things like that. So that that's one way to kind of uh, make it work. Uh, this is the, the, the DTAP that the guy was talking about. So this is a DTAP to, to, um, to whatever, the Blackmagic connector. And they also make a USB-C to, to, um, to that as well. So I, I carry them all in my bag uh, to just to make sure that um, there's kind of a constant paranoia of not having uh, a power cap because there's, no, there's nowhere to get it. So what I would say is the one thing if you're going to actually do production with a 6K, um, because it doesn't have a, a four pin to um, input, you just want to be paranoid. You have two power supplies, extra ways that you can plug it in because once you're in the field, there's nowhere to buy it unless you're in New York and can go to B&H. <laughs> right. And Jason? Yeah, I have a whole host of ways to do this. Um, the, my, my favorite way is, is just with, you know, battery packs that that um, I've bought from Guy over the years. And also, um, at least when I'm using the, um, the Ronin, you know, you can always get a D-tap to the Ronin. And, um, and then you can power, I believe, no, well, probably not a, probably not a larger cinema camera, but um, anything smaller than that, at least the earlier Ronins, you could absolutely power directly through the gimbal. Next question. Next one comes to us from Tony Mobley in Noonan, Georgia. I have a 12-inch ICANN teleprompter. It is on a metal shelf I purchased from Best Buy on my desk. If I were to get an A-series Sony camera, would it fit or do I need a tripod to make it all work? Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, I think you'd need a tripod to get it to work best. I mean, it's possible you could get a balance that would work on a desk. Um, they make some desktop uh, hi-hats or such that you could uh, mount them. But once you have a camera on there, you have to deal with the uh, the balance and getting the center of gravity correct so that uh, the teleprompter is happy with it. And, de and it depends on the camera you're getting. And the, the slide that uh, ICANN, I think, supplies allows you to move that camera in and out uh, to get the uh, proper lens position. It's not like an iPhone. Go ahead, Jesse. Yeah, I see a lot of uh, jiggly cameras these days, and the reason is because the camera is on the desk. So if you can separate those two things, you'll have a lot less uh, jiggliness. Jason? You don't need a normal tripod. So, I mean, if you get like a zero, um, you know, kind of like a zero height tripod like this, um, you might be able to get away with this and a tiny little ball head um, if you can find one that's strong enough. And Bill. I was just going to say, I when I was setting up my desktop rig here for the small teleprompter that I use, it was a bit of a challenge. And the challenge was finding a tripod that could go on the top shelf for my camera that was small enough. And I had to go, I think I went through three before I finally found one that would get the camera lens to the right height. So it, it is a little bit trial and error. Uh, thankfully, Amazon and some other companies let you try something. And then if it doesn't work, send it back. I did that a couple of two or three times. And also I ended up uh, for the actual tripod mount, I have a lip on the desk and I actually used a Mafer clamp and a little spud into the bottom of the tripod, uh, into the bottom of the teleprompter fixture to make that all work. It took a little while. I mean, you know, w tripods are generally for mounting on, on big camera tripods and finding the right system for you to affix it to something in a small area like in front of you on the desk turned out to be a little bit of a challenge. Got it done, but it was not easy. And Mickey shares, I would skip the camera for now, work on the set and lighting first. Next question. Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana says, I'm trying to find a good stand for an OBSBOT webcam. Has a standard screw mount on the bottom. What have people used for tripods to hold notes and mics as one unit? Go ahead, Alex. So a lot of tripods are round. <laughs> that makes them easy to grab onto. So one of the things you want to look at is possibly getting some, some arms, uh, short short arms are great ways to kind of put extra things on the tripod. So you basically put your, you have your camera, your little, whatever you want to have on the top and then on the legs. And you, sometimes you want to slightly heavier your tripod to pull this off, but not a lot. I mean, even with a, a Manfrotto 190, you can grab onto those legs with super clamps. And so um, newer, it probably makes the least expensive uh, super clamps. These are like little clamps. I don't think I have any sitting right in front of me. Usually I do. Um, but these are like little clamps that will clamp onto the, they're, they're really good at getting a hold of the tripod legs. And then you can get these little newer arms. The clamps are like three bucks and the arms are like 
a twelve dollars, and they'll and when you loosen them, you can kind of move them around anywhere you want and put them out there. Now, if you really want it to work, you'll get nogas because <laughs> the noga arms they uh, they're going to have a lot more. Uh, they're going to last a lot longer. They're going to they're going to lock a lot better, but they are ten times more expensive. So if you're but if you're looking for you know I ha- I have a handful of noga arms. Um, I used to have probably a hundred of the newer ones, and when they went bad, we retired them and went on to the next ones because it was still, you know, we were sending them out in all these kits and everything else. But a lot of times you'll see us grab onto it. They'll have a whole bunch of these little arms sticking out so we can kind of build what we want. And we put monitors on them. I would put little shelves on them, put extra mics on them. All those things are things that we can, we can add to them. And by the way, uh, your, uh, the, um, screw sizes, having it lots and lots and lots of adapters. I have a bag that gets me from everywhere from a mic stand to quarter, Mic stand to three eighths, three eighths to quarter, three eighths to mic stand. All of those, I have as many, you know, three or four of each one of them in a bag because then it just doesn't really matter. It's the screw size it's because you have basically three. You have quarter, 20, you have three eighths and you have a mic. And those are the big ones that you're going to deal with on a day-to-day basis. And Guy. Yeah, Small Rig has a bunch of stuff so, as well as Manfrotto. Uh, if it's just something quick and dirty, we have this little crazy head tripod that's 59 bucks. It'll allow you to get a couple arms dangling off. Uh, for the bigger stuff, I like the Triad Orbit. It has just crazy, I mean, there's so many options. I have, well, they're all around me. So I, I have uh, Triad Orbit stuff that'll bend and 3 A's, 5 A's, quarter. Uh, as well as tablet holders, and then my tri- this whole uh, rig for my uh, teleprompter sitting on one, and you can get casters and roll it around. So uh, I would take a look at the Triad Orbit stuff as well. Next question. Next one comes to us from Chris Widener again in Lafayette, Indiana. He says, without using screen share, what is the best, he has it in quote, way to share documents for display in Zoom meetings? Alex? A10 Mini. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it is it, it, in Zoom specifically, though, because um, uh, it doesn't work as well. Cutting into your dis- into your presentation doesn't work as well in st- something like Blue Jeans, because Blue Jeans won't automatically put your you know it's not it's your, it doesn't pin in the same way or as, as effectively as Zoom does. So someone can't quite pin that or spotlight it in the same way. So specifically for Zoom, the A10 Mini, just the little the little one is great if you can have another, either the second monitor from your, um, the second monitor from your main computer or another computer that's gonna do your presentation. Um, I, I recommend um, that you get a, if you're gonna do a lot of presentations that you get a separate computer. That can be PowerPoint on a little B-Link by Courtney, uh, or it can be a Mac mini or something that is going to be your second input that only does presentation. If, if this is your job and or it makes a difference, put it on a separate computer and don't put anything else on it. So you don't have anything else accidentally show up. It's the input for that thing. It does the thing. And that's, you know, if you're going to do it day in, day out, that's the best way to do it. And Courtney. Yeah, what Alex said. But the thing to remember is you have to be Alex Lindsay to get the 1080p uh, Zoom meeting. So if you're at 720p and you're using a uh, ATEM to put your document up there, you might want to choose larger fonts because smaller, tiny fonts may not come across at 720p. So just take that into consideration because you may not be getting the 1080 that we enjoy here. Be Alex or Guy Cochran. <laughs> what are the two, Alex? I, what, I, what I will say is that uh, if you're building slides that you can't read at 640 by 360, there's too much text on them. You know, like, 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 that, like that's a... That's a big, big moment that if they can't read them at six, I know people make them in ways that, that are readable, are readable, but I would not recommend it. Um, you know, slides are, you know, slides should be, you know, simplified enough that you can easily read them at 640 by 360. He did say documents. So that's what I was going on. Oh, right. So, yeah. Documents. You are correct. Documents is. They not have the ability to do that. That's true. That's true. Yeah. And then you, then you would need to use, uh, if you don't have a 1080p account, and the document needs more than 720p, then you're right. You would absolutely need to to, to um, use screen share. And Jesse? And of course, test it on a phone. I mean, one of the primary yeah, monitors good. of everybody's setup nowadays should be a phone. So if you can't read it on a phone, there's a lot of folks that are not going to be able to read it. All right. I, I just want to say one last thing, as I was just yeah. talking to someone about that yesterday, of the dramatic change that's happened with their viewer, viewing behaviors 
where they're seeing just, you know, the number of phone users just exploding, you know, that, that are watching your videos and watching everything else on phones. Uh, you're absolutely right, Jesse, that it's, it's critical to make sure that people can read whatever you're doing on a phone because it's becoming 50, 60, 70% of the viewers um, on, a, on a show are doing it through a mobile device. Hey, next question. Next one comes to us from JB in Wisconsin. And JB says, at what point would the panel recommend that somebody upgrade their home studio network from a regular router to something more in the prosumer category like Ubiquity? All right, let's slip through these, uh, John. So the question is, when do you upgrade? If you're part of this group and you're doing media, you're editing media, you're streaming media, you're going to want to upgrade Ubiquity, Dream Machine Pro. If you get into Wi-Fi, make sure you get the 6E Wi-Fi, which are not they're right out of stock right now because I'm in the middle of upgrade. But your network should be all at least 10 gig, 10 gig, um, and and they're super reasonably priced. They have a 10 gig switch for a couple hundred, like 250 bucks. Uh, but if you're moving big media files around and you're using Dante and you're using uh, NDI, you're going to want to upgrade your network here. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, I'll reiterate that it is such a, an incremental um, piece. It, sorry, not incremental. It is such an important piece that um, to me, it should be one of the first things. I would steer you away from any of the consumer grade ubiquity stuff. You need to go with the professional level stuff or you will be disappointed. And Alex? When your job or your income, when your income start is affected by uh, what you do at home, then you should upgrade your equipment. So when it's just hanging out with family and everything else, you probably don't need that. As soon as you're trying to do sales and really in business meetings, if you're working from home, uh, this is, you know, like having a, a car to get you to work. You need to start really thinking about your internet connection because when you have lots of trouble, you, uh, you know, getting on, when you're breaking up during a meeting, when you don't sound good or look good, it affects how people view you. It, it affects your authority within the meeting. And, and so you want to always take that into account as well. Next question. Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana is up next. Has anyone tried the OBS bot UVC to HDMI adapter from OBSBOT Tiny slash Tiny 4K? OBSBOT turns a USB pan tilt zoom into an HDMI pan tilt zoom, but not sure how far I should trust it. Jesse? I haven't tried it, but Kiloview actually just released something similar that can take a USB camera and make an NDI signal out of it. So, you know, they're a pretty well-known manufacturer that I like. I um, haven't tried the Ozbot one, though. Next question. Douglas Carmichael is up, up next with this one. Resolve can directly support recording VST instruments from the Fairlight audio page as shown here. And he has a link there. If you were editing to a soundtrack you are composing, would this give you any advantage to using a digital audio workstation? Alex? I don't know if it gives you an immediate advantage. The, what what I believe Resolve and what Blackmagic's doing with Resolve is designed to do is not make... is not force you to go anywhere else <laughs> so so that you can th theoretically finish a movie all in one place they're not there yet it's like journey and um, but they are very aggressively probably more aggressively than any other nle right now or any other uh, package they have more engineers um, with more focus and more money than anybody else um, right now and so they are definitely moving faster down that path um, than 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 all of their competition to fi to finish this enormity <laughs> like the, is a very complex thing so the advantage of it is the, just mostly that you're not you're not punching this all out to pro tools you're not punching it all out to lo some other external piece and having to um you know bounce those and then bounce them back and create you know go back and forth so building them all in the same space does have its advantages but you i don't think that fairlight is you know competitive with pro tools yet you know, with, with those things, it is getting much better. And for many, for 90%, 95% of the work out there in volume, it's probably enough to do anything you need to do. Um, but for, I don't think it's going to change the way filmmaking audio post gets done uh, right now. But I think the advantage is really keeping it all in one, you know, under one roof. 
All right. There we have it. We've wrapped a great first hour. Thank you to our producers for your questions. We're going to make that transition now where we'll talk about the keys to volunteer management. A lot of times when you think about volunteers, the thought process is the nonprofit realm or even possibly the private sector. But as many of us are producing events and sometimes there'll be opportunities where you are looking for volunteers, whether it be um, to help on the ground at a, on a local site and or just office hours. <laughs> all, we're all volunteers here on office hours. And this today would just be an opportunity to talk through, you know, the things that work, those that, that don't. Uh, many of us also participate in houses of worship. And I'm just thinking through the times that I've had to manage volunteers and or working with a client. And then we have typically there'll be team leaders and then the team leaders have to, you know, oversee volunteers. And overall, when you get started with volunteer management, you really want to make sure that you are clear (laughs) on what tasks that you want them to what you want them to actually handle. Um, Oftentimes there will be some where is it are they going to be? client facing tasks, um, because then those you look at typically volunteers that you've worked with for a long time uh, or repetitively and or are there things just like running to FedEx and having runners and how vital those people are. So typically we'll start with a sheet of tasks. There are tools out there that you can use. Um, We keep it simple. Uh, A good Google Docs spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet to have all of those tasks and excuse me, and things like a Google form so that when you're actually recruiting volunteers and having them to fill that out and knowing that volunteers, they're essentially doing this for a couple of reasons. Either they want to learn something, uh, either they are really passionate about what it is that you're doing, whether that are, you know, some people where the Susie Coleman runs or um, Jump Rope for Heart, those types of things. So they're passionate about the cause and really knowing what volunteers are looking to achieve is is an important part of it as well, because you want to make sure that they're aligned with what you're doing. And then also because they're giving of their time, they're giving of their talents that you put them in the right place because there's nothing worse than having all this great talent around you and not being prepared for them and not um, really making sure that they have a great experience. So that also includes how you incentivize them. Uh, I remember there are times I worked on production at church and they made sure they fed us. So we're coming in at six o'clock in the morning. We had gourmet breakfast, you know, in the morning in between our breaks, having great food. Um, Just those being some of the things. And we, I invite you in the chat to let us know and share some of your experiences as well as we dive into this conversation. Chris? They're picking up trash bins out the window, so I apologize if there's extra noise. I think um, I think it's important to remember that um, just like uh, any, any economist will tell you that no transaction takes place unless both parties are, sat- are satisfied. Um, and it may be that you're buying something that's very expensive uh, and you're giving a lot of money to the person you're buying it from, so they're satisfied but you're hopefully getting some quality out of it. The same holds true with transactions that we have between human beings. And so when I ask you to do something for me for free, you're going to weigh the value that of what you will return that what you will get from that favor I'm asking of you. And like you said, uh, Liberty, it may be because you're learning something. It may be, uh, just a sense of community, being able to hang out with that tech crew and have bre- a great breakfast in between services or, or whenever, however that worked. But we always have to remember that. And one of the things that I used to do when I ran a bunch of uh, volunteers, uh, manage, I, I didn't run them, I managed them, uh, was I would always give them um, a say in decisions that that I was making as the tech leader. So I would get them together and say, hey, so 
the snare drum doesn't sound good. We need a better snare mic. What do you think we should get? Let's talk about it. And that sense of ownership that they got from that was super empowering. And you can, you know, extrapolate and put that, apply that to many different things. But I think it's very important that as we run or manage or, um, you know, participate in any sort of a volunteer situation, whether you're the volunteer or the person receiving the uh, services of that volunteer, we always have to think about that transaction. What is that person getting out of it? And it may just be knowledge, but I'll tell you, uh, when it all boils down, we are human beings and human beings need to be um, accepted. They need to have um, community. They need to feel loved. They need to feel wanted. They need to feel needed. And I think that's that to me is the most important thing. And that although the knowledge may be much more valuable without without those human elements, uh, the knowledge is almost worthless. Yeah, you make a good point there with the aspect of of community and how important that is for others. John in the comments, John Snyder says, so you need to motivate people using autonomy, mastery and purpose, just as some of the ele other elements as it relates to why why people are here and not overtaxing them. It might be considered free labor, but as you said, they are human beings and treating them as such, especially since they are giving to the cause or to the purpose. Um, Alex? Yeah, uh, I've been a volunteer a lot <laughs> throughout my childhood, uh, from my childhood all the way up to now. Um, and I've also, you know, managed fairly large teams of, of, of volunteers. And uh, I think that there's a couple things that always stick out for me. Uh, one is, is that people, exactly what Chris was talking about, people need to be needed. You know, they need to know that what they're doing makes at least some impact on on what you're working on. They need to know that potentially that it's going to make a difference, that it's not just that you need them, that the world needs them or that the organization needs them. And that what they're doing makes a difference for that organization, makes a difference for, uh, for you um, in, in their participation. They also, um, they, they, people love to be good at things. And here's the one of the biggest mistakes I see people make with with, with what they do is they don't they don't make um, outrageous requests. <laughs> you know, so so they don't make you know they they don't ask people to do things that are you know they they say well they're volunteering so we won't ask them to do very much, and then you end up in this position where you don't uh, you know you're not you're just kind of there doing something that isn't very hard. Um, what people want to do is they don't want to be overwhelmed and they don't want to fail but being pushed a little bit to be better at what they do so that they feel like they've built a skill, even if the skill isn't useful outside of that, that, um, that system. Uh, if, you, if they feel like they're part of something that is working really well and it's really organized, um, they get excited about being part of that. You know? And it was something that I learned. I, was, I, was, I started off, I was working with these seminars and I was volunteering and um, they asked me to do, because as a volunteer, the other side of this is that you want to, you just play hard at everything they give you, you know, like you, you, you know, that's, that's the way to make, have the most fun. You're there, you're not getting paid. There's no reason to play small. And so um, one of the things that we did is we had a, um, we had parking. So we were in a business park where we did these, these seminars and you could on Friday morning, you could only park in certain parts of the business park or ever, all the businesses would get upset. So how do you land all these cars? The, all the cars show up in 15 minutes to go to the seminar and you have to land basically 160 cars without them parking in the wrong place. And so one of the things that I, you know, I, I went and it, it's a disaster, you know, like when the first time I went. And so I said, I'd, I'd really like to run this team if I can, you know, and they, and they, and they said, okay. And so what we did is I, I, I told everybody we have to treat the, the cars like planes. You know, and so we we were literally doing doing the big arms like this, and and then and then and then you know doing big arm movements. We could always make sure that the car could see the next person, and we'd land them all in. And it was the first time that it went, and it was just this fun thing to watch all these cars going clink 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 clink, and it and it was and it and everyone was very, um, <laughs> everyone was very excited about how well it worked, well how well it went. Everyone wanted to be on that team after that. It's a silly team. We're parking cars, you know, but everyone wanted to be on the parking team because there was this huge, there was a, 
a, a serotonin return for a, a just a, a job well done. <laughs> you know, like that, that it just, it's a difficult job. You're dealing with a lot of people are gonna make mistakes and you did it well. And, you know, I learned that, you know, working with people to do a great job. The reason I showed up for church every, more, every Sunday was because my uncle, uh, my great uncle would teach me how to use the mixer. You know, like he would, it wasn't, I didn't just go to go to church. I sat up in the little big booth above the church and he would show me what, how all the equalization works and how the, how the gain versus the, the, um, the faders and the, and all the bits and pieces and what the buzz was from and everything else. And I was like 12 years old and I, you know, it's hard to get me to go to church when I was a kid, but it was very easy to get me to sit up there and listen to church while I was, while I was running an audio board. And, you know, and, and so I think that also one of the things that organizations need to think about is you know, a lot of times they don't invest in anything. And so what the volunteers end up in is this nothing works. You know, they've got bad equipment. They've got things breaking down all the time. There's, you know, over time overruns, everything else. Uh, volunteers quit very, they burn out very quickly in that environment. When things, when you don't spend money on the labor, but you do spend money on the equipment, you spend money on the catering, you spend money on the things. Those are, those are much lower costs often than the labor is. Labor is usually the most expensive thing in every production is, you know, but like, I, I know that a lot of folks, like that's one of the things churches do a lot, the churches that really build up, um, cause I consult with some of them and they buy big mixers and they buy big cameras and they buy, it's much easier to get volunteers <laughs> you know, when, when they're not like, if they're working with a little handy cam, trying to move things around, you really have to have people that are committed when you're, when you give them broadcast cameras and you give them, they'll show up just to play with the hardware, you know? And so, so that's the, um, you know, it, it's a, it's, it, it seems counterintuitive, but those things, you know, people feeling like they're part of something bigger is really, really important. Yeah, just mission. And I'm I'm curious with your, um, when you said around 12, was that that you were interested in mixers and then that your uncle got you going or I, you had to go to church and they found something for you to do? No, <laughs> no, no, yeah, exactly. No, they, they um, I, uh, my parents never wanted to force uh, church on, on, on any of us. And so they didn't say you had to go to church. You know, my mom never wanted it to be that way. So until the mixers showed up, um, I was mostly watching Jackie Chan and Godzilla movies in the morning while my, the rest of the family went to church. Right. And, and so that was, that was really my thing. And then when I found out I could learn more about a, the mixer, when my uncle Tom, great uncle Tom said, you know, he'd saw me in some family function. He goes, you know, like we got a new mixer and you know, I could teach you how to use it. If you come to church, I was there every week, you know, and, and, um, you know, it's, uh, anyway, but the, uh, um, but the, I, I was building crystal, crystal radio sets from scratch when I was five and, and, um, you know, always inter my grandfather was, had a, a ham radio that he, <laughs> he built from scratch in the, I don't know, I think the forties or fifties. And so, um, so I grew up in kind of a lot around electronics. So it was interesting, but I didn't have access to a multi-channel mixer. Like that was something that I had never seen before. <laughs> so, right. so that was, that was the, uh, that was the thing. Awesome. Nigel. Yeah, just a couple of observations to add. First of all, if you've got a large uh, volunteer community, make sure they have someone who can be their voice. So volunteers can sometimes be nervous about making recommendations, often which are very good because they're seeing things you're not seeing. So make sure that you put enough of a management structure in a large volunteer organization that the person at the top can represent their voice. There's both someone they can go to and someone you can go to. And I think that becomes very important. The second thing is um, be very sensitive to the culture of what your volunteers communicate. There are there are two theaters in, in where I live in Austin, Texas. Well, there are more than two, but there are two that I, I go to regularly. And one of them, the volunteers view their role as fun and enjoyable and, uh, you know, part of the experience. And there's the other, which is where the opera and the ballet and the symphony does. And when you go to the, the second one for a non-opera ballet symphony thing, sometimes the volunteers feel like they're looking down their nose at the people. This is a comedy show and I don't know why we let swine like you in here. And I'm sure they don't mean to do that, but but it sets a tone about the location and it, and it changes the way the audience feels. So in the same way that you would have your staff be your brand ambassadors, be really clear that your volunteers are even more your brand ambassadors and how they communicate about you and your organization and your structure and your event can be much more significant. Excellent points. Alex? 
Yeah, and the, and, the, and the last thing is is that it's it's useful to think about artifacts that that that, that volunteers can walk away way with. It's something that I. I did a lot and I didn't really think much of it, but I, I realized that there were shirts. There was some, at some point I realized there were shirts from things that I'd volunteered from that I kept for a long time because I was part of that. And then I got really into it and I started producing, you know, shirts and things and little tags and other things that you would get while you were doing it. <laughs> I thought that it was kind of fun, but I suddenly realized everyone was was collecting everything. <laughs> like, you know, people, you know, collect those kinds of things. Backstage passes, those are really popular ones. Like things that look like backstage passes with lanyards. It's amazing how like people, you start handing those out and people will become obsessed with getting them. Um, with Pixelcore, we had uh, shirts that said Pixelcore staff on them, whatever. It was mostly so I could figure out who, we had so many volunteers at Pixelcore that I had to figure out who was who at an event. You know, like I just had to know where they were. So we gave them shirts and it became like, if we didn't produce a shirt, there was like an insurrection, you know, like, you know, so, so it was like, cause it would say Pixacore, you know, uh, San Francisco or New York or, or whatever, wherever we were. And it was, um, it was a big, it was a big deal, you know? So, so it, those are things that, that, um, we're about to start doing here. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, so I think that, uh, but, but I think that that was a, um, a, a popular thing and things that you can only get, it's not that you give them a shirt from the organization because they volunteered. It's something that you can only get as a volunteer are the things that you want to think about um, handing out. Yeah, and just to what Chris and Nigel shared about just that community aspect and that sense of belonging by having the exclusive volunteer shirt. Some people, I know people who collect shirts for, you know, as long of the, as they volunteered with organizations. And I just want to pull up what um, John Snyder is saying in the chat. One of the biggest issues with most volunteer groups is that they're rarely structured on, they have rarely have a structured onboarding process. Many people are willing to pitch in however needed but if someone doesn't get them involved in helping it's unused efforts and hopefully we'll get even into some of that of some of the best ways to to onboard as well all right bill let's get started with these questions okay our first one this morning comes from uh kenneth jones in seattle washington he starts with a dale carnegie quote be lavish in your approbation and hearty in your praise and the question really comes down to how do you pay your volunteers Go ahead, Bill. Well, this is one of the things we we're just kind of dancing around. And, and to me, it is having run crews of volunteers more than a few times in my life. It depends on what each person wants. Some volunteers come because they want to set, get a specific set of skills. Uh, what Alex was articulating, we found those people often. Other people are truly aligned with a cause if you're doing a charity kind of an effect an event and they just have a desire to help often it's people who have been in the situation that they're trying to help with they realized how difficult it was and so they really are motivated to put their effort into that um, and for me it was critical to ask at the intake meeting or when we got together why why is everybody here let's go through the room and i would pay special note to that because if you have somebody who turns out to be a good volunteer, if you have an insight into why they're spending their time doing this, you can match what you assign them to do and what they do with something that's important to them. And that will help bind them to the effort. Go ahead, Nigel. Yeah, the only thing to add there is that people want experiences, whether they're uh, you know, working for pay or working for free. And when they're working for free, those experiences are even more important because they now they may get that experience, maybe one of education or training or involvement or being able to see the concert or whatever it is. But think about the experience that you're offering and make that a good experience that fills that person full of something they're happy with. Yeah, Bill, and I think you touched on something really important there with whether whatever that intake process is and the onboarding, finding out what their motivators are and being the person who's over volunteers, using that as an opportunity to even share with your up lead of we should probably look in this direction, like really advocating for volunteers. And that's just a part uh, of the leadership process as well. And just keys to success, because if they're not having a great experience, you will have a hard time recruiting people in the you know forthcoming years because volunteers talk, <laughs> people talk and just that being equally as important. Alex. And one, one big thing is structure. You know, I, I volunteered a couple of places and one of the things I like about it is I can kind of drop in, but I, it is, um, 
I just know what's, I know what to expect as a volunteer, you know, and I think that that makes a big difference. Uh, and again, the, the, that structure can also be playing a little bit harder. I used to, you know, I went from that little parking position to running the seminars that I was volunteering at. And, um, and it was, and I had whole teams and it's a weekend seminar, you know, it's like you, you're there from Friday morning until Sunday night. And, and, uh, and people would say, well, can I work on Saturday afternoon from one to four? And I'd be like, nope, you got to buy into the whole thing. <laughs> you got to do like, like it was, it was a very contrary thing. Like you, you, I wasn't acting out of, out of scarcity. I was like, you got to show up on Friday morning and you'll be done on Sunday night and that's it. You know, and um, it was, it was much harder to get the team, but it was so much more fun, you know, cause people were, you know, like it was one team, it was unified and people want, and then after that, people wanted to do it all the time because uh, it was a great experience because that structure, you know, was there for them to, to really, um, you know, grow. And it's, but sometimes you have to make harder requests than what you, what you would normally do with volunteers. And Bill? I just wanted to return with, you know, to me, one of the key elements was the amount of effort I put into the training of the volunteers. Uh, I had at one point maybe 150 people showing up for a three-day event. And we spent a lot, the first couple of years, I didn't do as good a job with getting the information out as to what the rules were and how to do it. I eventually made a little video and made everybody go through it. And I can't tell you the difference it made for the volunteers' satisfaction. When they walked out, they knew exactly this, the parameters they could work in. They knew what they could do. This was a beer festival, so we had liquor laws and things they had to be in compliance with. Uh, the charity didn't want to get any negative dings on their record, so we had to be right about this. And and putting more effort into making sure that each volunteer went out knowing the parameters they had to work in and could feel confident about it so they weren't just trying to answer a lot of questions they didn't know became a huge motivator. They came back the next year, many of my volunteers, and said, it was so much fun because I didn't wonder what to do. I knew what to do. That's so good. Alex? The more direct uh, benefits that, that you can pay volunteers with is a handful of things like food, access, a place to hang out, a place to, you know, like, so like at a, a lot of people volunteer, like if you go to a Seagraph or a, or a Sigraph for Carmi, um, or, a, or an NAB or other things, there's lots and lots of volunteers. <laughs> and the reason they're volunteering is because they get access to the seminars, they get access to the, um, they get access to the expo floor, they get to park somewhere closer than everybody else, they get food, they get a, a, a room that they can, you know, hang a breakout room, a break room that isn't what the public has. So those are all little things that you can provide for volunteers uh, in a larger event that is worth every ounce of their effort <laughs> to, to get to get around those when they're on the when they're not you know when they haven't made it yet when they're trying to you know get started and start to meet people it's a really really valuable thing to give them yeah that keyword being access access oh, to yeah. different opportunities yes and if there is a celeb or somebody notable giving them access to like go and meet them those <laughs> with, with, seemingly little things <laughs> With, with yeah. some with some limits. The, yeah, the, be the, careful the, there. Yeah, it's, it's super like <laughs> right. it's, it's it's so easy for someone to get over their you know kind of get over their skis. They get excited about being around a celebrity, and they do all kinds of horrible things that that might make them really excited, but the celebrity is never coming back. So so you have to be very careful of of those things. But you're absolutely right of getting um, you know feeling like they're part of it and feeling like they have access to it, and then again teaching them how to work with. Uh, celebrities is also valuable one. And, and if they know that th this is the big thing also is upward mobility. If I know that I'm going to start with something and that I might end up somewhere that's interacting, there might be volunteers that have been there for a couple of years that interact with the celebrities, but they've learned how to do that. They know how to do it. They do it appropriately. And you know that if I start here and I keep on working on it, I may get to a point where I get to, you know, hang out with Tom Cruise or whatever that is. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. so just or, or open the door for him is it, usually it's not so much hang out with them. It's it's open the door appropriately and 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 don't don't gather too much attention. Right. Signed autographs, books, paraphernalia, whatever that might look like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next question. Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. Up next, getting the word out to the right eyes to get volunteers can be the hardest part. What's your best strategies for getting volunteers and those with special skills? Go ahead, Bill. So I have three things that I'd like to just 
touch on really briefly. The first one is uh, something that Nigel just commented on. I think it's really so make the project cool. The cooler the project can be, the more likely people are going to want to work with it. I did a thing where uh, early in uh, my learning multicam, I staged a multicam shoot and I was talking to a photographer's group and they all wanted to move into video. And I was suddenly inundated with volunteers, extra cameras, extra people, because it was something they wanted to learn about really bad. And I thought the the project itself was cool. Uh, trade a little bit. And what I mean by that is first volunteer for others and you're going to get into these communities of people who like to volunteer. And then eventually you can ask them to volunteer for your things. Now that's a smaller thing that it's more targeted, but it helps you find those qualified volunteers because they're in the community. And the last thing is with the uh, with the beer festivals I ran, there's corporations often in your area, the banks are really good for this, who make volunteerism a th part of their looking at their employees and they want a well-rounded employee. So I was able to go to major banks or financial institutions or other groups and get 50 volunteers for a weekend event because we were a legit operation run well, a 501c3, and their people wanted that on their resumes as well. Yeah, those employee resource groups. Great point. Alex? Yeah, the the main the main thing again. What, what I want to echo what Bill said around doing something audacious or something bigger is actually gathers more people than doing something basic, you know. And so uh, oftentimes, you know, and and maybe you're doing something basic, but making sure that you're clear of what the the opportunities are, you know, of of doing that basic thing. And the, you always got to keep people focused on the cathedral they're building, not the rock that they're they're cutting right now. Next question. Next question, Douglas Carmichael. With a previous court cases where unpaid interns have successfully recovered wages for work that would be classified as employment, how do you protect yourself against said legal action by your volunteers? Go ahead, Alex. Well, and that's where you need to structure a 501c3. Technically, you really can't do it as a for-profit. You know, you're either un unorganized or a 501c3, but if you're a corporation, you, you really... Um, there's the the way some corporations go around this or or people who need volunteers is they build what they call a training program that you pay for. Then it might be $50 a quarter you know, that you're interested in being part of that training program. And they're and that that's a different that's class differently um, to make that to make that happen. And they really have a, have to have a lot to offer to get people to do that. But um, but it, it is a way that 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 you turn it into a training program as opposed and they you, they can't be a free training program. It has to be um, something that they pay some nominal fee for. Um, but the, my high recommendation is if you have volunteers, you want to from the get go for, just form it into a 501c3. Next question. Next one comes from Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. Chris this time says, I've done lots of volunteer thank you gifts other than shirts. What have you gotten that you remember fondly? Ooh, that's a good one. Alex? Uh, you know, a lot of them I get back to the lanyards. You know, I volunteer on a lot of things and people would give out lanyards. And for a long time, I've lost them in the number of moves that I've made and everything else. But for a long time, I had a and this is both from stuff that I volunteered for and stuff that I did, but I had a, a hook in my office and you just hook the next lanyard over top of it. And it had hundreds and hundreds of lan lanyards just hanging off. And they're, and here's the thing about lanyards is they're, they're an artifact that reminds you of that moment. You know, and when you, when you, you can, if someone walks into your office, you can flick through them and tell them how it was when you were here and how it was when you were there and, and, and so on and so forth. So I think that, um, uh, you know, the, it's the easiest one to to hand people. I've got some pins <laughs> that were given to me uh, by security, <laughs> so so um, to identify me. Uh, the that uh, I I don't know if I was supposed to give back or not, but I I still have them. Um, anyway, uh, so so those are like. But again, it doesn't have to be big things. It's it's artifacts that that you can kind of sit around. At least that's been my experience of the things as a volunteer that I that I like. Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, take a group photo at the end of the production or whatever it is, if you have a, especially if you have a celebrity, get everybody together, especially all the volunteers and all the people, the nameless people who help put the production together and get them together in a group photo and make sure you send that photo out. Uh, have someone who's not one of the volunteers take the photo and make sure you send that photo out to everybody that's on that uh, volunteer list. And Chris. Along with what Alex was saying, uh, I... I was involved with a group where we traveled around six cities uh, a year around the world, actually <clears throat> doing shows for them. And I would make 
just little fun, like commemorative lanyards. Uh, they looked they looked very official, official enough that they got some of our crew into NAB when they left their actual credentials back at the hotel. Um, <laughs> they just flashed it and walked by. Right. But I, I got to the point where I would show up on set and, you know, the crew would be there for a couple of days. And literally, like, the lighting guys would come scurrying out of the lighting grid going, do we have a new pa- pass? You know, and th- they loved them. They yeah. absolutely loved them. And then you'd see like recurring crew members and they'd have like the last three or four on their lanyard. And it was a lot of fun. Just a lot of fun. Go ahead, Alex. Um, security bracelets that people save too. And, and and here's the funny thing about security bracelets for volunteers is it a it does let you identify who's, who's who, you know, in the thing, but, but it also makes them feel like they're part of a family, like they're part of something. You know, it's a really simple thing of just like, we're going to have everybody, um, you know, uh, get a bag. And, and a lot of us have a lot of bracelets. I don't keep all of them because I've got too many. But but um, uh, they, uh, people do uh, like those. The final gift I would say is if you're working with a, with a high profile individual, uh, that individual thanking the crew is a, is a big deal. I, you know, I work, uh, done, I've done quite a few events with them. Um, uh, Barack Obama, and you know, he came up building uh, volunteer staffs. And the one thing I can tell you that we <laughs> you almost expect you don't want to expect anything from a former president of the United States, but I will say that he thanks the entire crew. It almost feels like he's thanking them individually on every event that he works on. You know, and and he's never, you know, he it, it's like at the end of the show, he'll you know we're all, there's like fifty of us there, and he's. Like, I, I haven't, it hasn't been recent, you know, it was pre-COVID, but, uh, but there'll be like 50 people there and he'll thank you. And you, he feels like, you feel like he's thanking you, you know, like for that. And it's a, it's, it's something that he, he understands that math really well. Yeah. It's these small intangibles that are, yeah. make a big difference. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, that was my experience with Obama too. He's extremely gracious in that regard. I made the mistake. I too have a um, there you <laughs> a go. whole See. bunch just everywhere. And I touched my door handle and these are the ones that fell off. <laughs> so you still got some there too. Gift cards are always, um, especially depending on the type of event, just gift cards, having a great after event dinner with the with the crew are always just some things that those are remember lulu luluman um gift cards gift cards are great go ahead alex yeah and, and a lot of times you can get partners that are part right. of the show to give you the gift cards so if starbucks was part of it getting coffee gift cards is really easy from starbucks <laughs> so and so is so our meal meal things from mcdonald's those are like super super easy to put together and um the the, the one thing i will say about the lanyards when jason was picking them up is you know, it's funny that the difference between the tech industry and the music industry, as far as how they build those cards, the music industry designs them, you know, and the tech industry just kind of makes them usable. It's worth designing. Like it, it's really cool when you put out cool lanyards that remind you of what what's there. And it takes, you know, uh, I used to be an intern building them. <laughs> you know, so it doesn't in Photoshop. So it, it, it doesn't take a lot of skill to put them together once you build a format. And depending on if there's a program, listing the names of your volunteers where there's something that people see that they were a part of, that can also go a long way as well. Yeah. Next question. Courtney Gooden in Hollywood comes up with this interesting one. How do you gracefully remove a volunteer worker who may be messing up the production by doing things their way? I'm so happy you did this because I was hoping somebody would come in with the like, okay, not everyone makes a great volunteer. Go ahead, Alex. It's one of the hardest things in volunteering is that it, we're working with volunteers is um, it, the biggest one that's hard is when someone's inappropriate and firing them, you know, is is really a, and so a lot of it has to do with with guiding them and, and trying to make sure they're clear where the rails are because a lot of people aren't inappropriate on purpose. They literally aren't conscious um, to what they're saying or what they're doing that makes people uncomfortable. So really setting that up, it also comes down to um, how you gather volunteers, you know, so you want to as best you can not do volunteer drives, but really just people know that that organization exists, the more subtle you can make it where people can just join if they choose to, um, the better group you're going to get to make that work. Um, so, so, you know, on, how you on ramp and how you put that together and how you, that makes a huge difference in getting into these situations when they are messing it up doing their way. I think that one of the things that we do is find them another job that is out of the, out of harm's way, <laughs> you know, like, Hey, I need, I, you know, we need some help over here. 
I don't know, you know, moving the trash or something, but you know, like I need you to move over here to do something. Try to make it not be moving the trash. Try to make it move like something that doesn't feel like a demotion, but just feels like something else that just gets them away from whatever they were damaging. Um, you know, and that definitely happens and it happens with, um, you know, and the, the funny thing is, is that one of the things that's really important about volunteers is to see them, you know, so you as a person that's doing it, want to see what they're good at, you're looking for, you know, when you want to pay attention to people around you in what drives them, what are they good at? What, you know, um, what are they interested in? And so when a lot of times if I'm working on almost anything, I'm asking questions. And as I ask those questions, I'm, you know, piecing together what, you know, a model of that person, you know, that, that person, <laughs> you know, and, and like what is important to them. Cause I, you know, that's, what's going to, you know, and it's not, it's not in, in a really, a how do I get them to do something, but really how do I serve them as the person that's running the event so that they feel like they've, they've done something useful where they're good at it and they're successful and everything else. So, so when I'm, you know, if you mismatch that, then you got to find how to match that up because I've had, I think I've told the story before I had an employee who was breaking things and just was not useful. And I put him in another position and he just was rain man. Like you just, and so you, 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 I always, that was the biggest lesson for me that everybody is rain man somewhere and everybody's going to break stuff in other places. And a lot of it as a manager, your job, whether it's for profit or nonprofit, your job is to fit the square piece in the square hole and the round piece in the round hole. And, the, and, and if you're not getting, if they're not working out, a lot of times you're just not, you as a manager, if you're hundred percent accountable for your team, uh, just aren't matching those up effectively. So move them out of the way or find their Rain Man skill. Yeah, yeah, Got exactly. <laughs> Bill? Yeah, very much what Alex said about moving them, I think is a good thing. But there's also another layer to this, depending on the size of the organization. Um, I remember a I, couple of circumstances. I remember the first time I had literally had to let somebody go from this kind of a thing and how difficult it was, but how important it was to me as a manager to be able to put my feelings for that person or for the situation aside and do the job necessary for the organization to run smoothly. When it came time in another circumstance with a slightly bigger organization to do the same thing, I made sure, I, my initial thought was I'll do this job because it's a hard job. But then I thought, wait a second, I'm cutting out the supervisor of their area and he or she may need to learn this same job. So I stopped first and said to the, to the division person, I will go there with you or you can do this yourself or I would do it. What makes you feel comfortable? Because this is hard and maybe it's the right time in your career as you're going to accelerate to learn how to let somebody go properly. Uh, which would you like me to do? And they very gratefully said, thank you. I, you know, I've never had to do this before. I realize that it's hard to do. And learning that skill to be gentle with someone by letting them know they're not a good fit and this is not going to work out. Um, is another step in the management ladder. Yeah, sometimes it's just hard for them to to come out and say it. So great point there, Bill. Courtney? Yeah, other than saying, uh, Alex, can you go count up all the toothpicks over there for us? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, you have to use a lot of tact. That's, that's, that was one of the reasons I asked the question. You know, these days, you got to be careful because if you don't, if they're volunteer, you don't may not know that person psychologically, and they may not be all all there. And if you give them a menial job to do to get them out of the way, they may go out. You know, they may go postal on you. You never know. That's you have to use a lot of tact and be very yeah. careful about that stuff. Alex, yeah, and I think that in general, the one thing I will say is working with volunteers is probably the most valuable skill that you can build. I mean, I, I think Warren Buffett said that. Uh, to learning, you know, learning how to speak in public is the most important thing or learning how to communicate your ideas is the most important thing someone can learn. And, but I think that working with volunteers is pretty high up there, if not higher uh, than that, because they're not motivated by money. They're not just here because you're, they're getting paid. They're not just, you know, just paying, making the paycheck. They're here because they're motivated to be there. And for one reason or another, and it is a much more difficult management process. And I highly recommend that anybody who gets an opportunity to both volunteer, it's, it's also just a, a better, you know, I don't know, being around a lot of people that care about what they're doing all the time <laughs> and aren't, you know, trying to figure out, you know, how they're going to move up the ladder or how they're going to do other things like that is, um, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun, but it also is some of the best training I've had um, in my, in my lifetime. Next question. 
Tony Mobley is up next from Noonan, Georgia. Conversations with Tony Mobley has tried a variety of systems to do this show. We're now primarily using Zoom webinar meetings, vMix, and AWS, working to get better, but we need volunteers uh, there. C-level guests coming soon. Please push notes. Oh, okay. Um, so that's his question. How does he get more volunteers there? Go ahead, Guy. Yeah, Tony, I'd put up a, a place on your website that shows the crew positions and detail out what they're doing and what you can learn. In a perfect world, uh, I would also have the guy set up a, a parallel system so you could have like a trainee system where that one goes out to uh, maybe a, a private or hidden YouTube stream so they can cut with uh, you know the bumpers up, so to speak. So the, the following um, or subsequent shows, they're good enough once they've proven that they can take the show. But yeah, not having enough volunteers, especially you're, you're in dangerous territory where you don't have enough uh, TDs to cut your show because somebody gets sick. I mean, COVID going around, we've had a couple people, you know, no show, no, if they don't show up, there's no show, you know? So, uh, but I think what you have is something special, which is um, a system that people are interested in and learning about. So you have some behind the scenes. I would, I would be carving out like 30 minutes saying, Hey, volunteers, you get to sneak peek behind the scenes. And if you want to give them something of value, maybe there's some, uh, a headset or a small stream deck or something because they'll need a stream deck if they need to cut the show. So depending on what you put as a value on that, maybe you, you find some kind of sponsor or something to be able to, to get those stream decks or some AWS time, you know, leave the system up for an extra hour or two after, or maybe, you know, throw them a bone that, Hey, we can replicate this whole system for you if you need it. So that you, you have a lot of, there's a lot of value sitting there. I'm surprised more people haven't taken you up on this because you're sitting on a gold mine. Yeah, I like what Guy shared too, just even in you explaining like Zoom webinar, vMix, AWS, making sure that however, wherever you talk about the need for volunteers, that you really play up on the benefits and more so focusing on what they're going to receive more so than what, you know, than your need. So this is great training ground, breaking, you know, breaking, cutting edge tech, sorry, <coughs> cutting edge technology. So that would make it really helpful. Next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next. And Douglas, in this case, says, volunteers, if you provide benefits, housing, food, and so forth to your volunteers, are the value of those benefits going to be taxable? Alex? I am not an accountant or a lawyer. I do not think that they're taxable. <laughs> I think generally they're a support service there. It's kind of like if your company flies you around to go to, go to locations, that's not taxable either. You know, like that you're not getting taxed on the company flying you all over the world or, or doing other things. Those are things around it. Um, so I've never, never seen that considered that way, but I don't know. It could be a law that I don't, that I don't know about. <laughs> I haven't got enough of it that would really worry about it personally. So haven't really thought through that. Go ahead, Bill. I'm also not an accountant or anywhere close to it, but I do remember that for the volunteer organization or for whatever organization do it, this should generally go out, I would assume, under cost of goods sold because they can't produce the product without this. Uh, but you should probably talk to somebody who's actually studied accounting in your area under your rules to get good advice on this. Next question. Next one comes from Douglas Carmichael. Alex, you mentioned the allure of a bigger hardware being a driver to attract volunteers. How do you manage the risk of damage from inexperienced volunteers? Would collecting a damage deposit be a useful tool or is that a management issue? Go ahead, Jason. Absolutely not to the damage deposit. Uh, I Correct. think the right way to do this is to front load and um, and simply take some time and teach them how to... Um, how to treat you know this big expensive piece of hardware with a little bit of reverence, but no, absolutely not, never on a damage deposit. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, the uh, the, the damage deposit is a disaster. Uh, I've there been some of us who have thought about it, but uh, never actually done it. We've seen other people do it in nonprofits, and it's a you know it's it just develops a relationship between you and the volunteers that is not good. You know, it's it's a lack of trust. And if they actually broke something, had to pay for it, it'll, it'll, you'll lose like not just that person, but half of them around them. So um, it's a, it's, it's definitely not something you want to go down the path with. Um, the, to, to what Jason said, what you really want to do is make sure that A, the people that are there understand how to use the board, B, that you, uh, you train people on how to use whatever equipment that they're using well, and you do that over time. You don't just bring them in and say, okay, now use this camera. Um, usually that you want to give them time to do that and see that you set up a series of expectations, you know, so 
you know, uh, how the show runs and how it gets put together. A lot of that has to do with building infrastructure around it, the right cases, uh, the right tripods, the right bags, the right things that are well-named, things that are organized, things that there's a way that you put these things back together. And all of that combined with training, I have to admit that we've done an enormous, I worked on an enormous number of crews, volunteer crews, and my paid crews have definitely damaged way more things, <laughs> you know, than, than my volunteers have. And Courtney? Yeah, supervision and insurance, I'd say. Uh, you know, always carry enough insurance to cover damage, uh, incidental damage by those that are using the equipment. And, uh, and supervise. You know, if you have something that's very expensive, have one person that you know, even if they're a volunteer, that you know knows how to use that equipment, knows how to treat it right, and have them supervise the other volunteers so that they can serve as kind of a, a trainer to the people that are trainees. And once they get enough experience with that equipment, then they can be moved up into a supervisor role. So, um, you know, structure it in a way you would in a corporation with a supervisor and a uh, and a trainee or, a, you know, a, a new volunteer or intern. And it comes back to this is an experience that they can have using this big G925 whatever <laughs> device and making it a thing that they actually like. That's where that training aspect will come into it. And then Kenneth Jones says the key is to make it experience like teaching them. And Chris Weiner says, no, 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 that's what insurance is for. So just a reminder, you never want it to be something that detracts them from wanting, wanting to help in the future. Next question. Comes from our friend Tlaloc Miguel Lopez Waterman in New York City. It seems that very large volunteer organizations have large logistics teams to help keep get people what they need for information and missing details. Should the managing folks be on staff, paid? Where is the paid, non-paid line best drawn? Go ahead, Alex. Uh, at, at some size, you always have to move to staffing to support um, folks that are permanently staffed. Right. Um, and a, a lot of times the way the way I look at it as where does that staff benefit the volunteers? <laughs> you know, like so you're supporting the volunteers and supporting the organization. And where do you need to guarantee an output? So when they're working on something that has to be, it has to come out correctly. A lot of times you'll start to, and that means you have um, sponsors, you have donors, you have other things. That show has to now actually work. Um, you know, a lot of times now there's some that people continue to volunteer. So it's, it, you'd be surprised at how high in an organization you can end up with volunteers um, when, there's, when there's enough opportunity um, for those volunteers. I, I work with a, an organization, I'm working with an organization right now and I'm kind of surprised that the people that are there are volunteers. Um, you know, it seems like a lot of their day is, is spent on this thing and they, but they are passionate. They love to do what they do. Um, and uh, they, they put it together um, really well. But I think that that's where you have to look at it is how do you make sure that the, the things that need to be guaranteed are getting done? Go ahead, Bill. All of that. Uh, it's in my volunteer crew experiences early in my life that I learned a good little bit about the management stuff uh, that I came to use later, uh, particularly in terms of uh, the structure of 501c3s, why it's important to keep them intact and how you can lose your status if you don't do things by the book. I've also served on volunteer corporate boards that were usually under a larger organization. And it was interesting to see that the staff had a finger into it, but also kept their distance because the liability of messing with the board's decision or trying to steer them too much rather than motivating them to make the best decisions possible for the 501 C3 and then staying out of their hair, their hair always became a thing. It was in those circumstances that you learn about corporate governance, you learn about uh, insurance regulations, you learn about a ton of things that are really useful when you go into real business, but you're a little bit protected under the corporate umbrella and having a board of directors making decisions rather than you just doing things and getting in trouble for it. So it's a great pathway into understanding the dynamics of larger organizations. Next question. Douglas Carmichael says, would providing lifestyle benefits like on-site child care for volunteers be a way to attract and keep them? Go ahead, Alex. 
definitely removing some of the barriers that people might have related to um, to their volunteering uh, is something that will make it easier for some of them that are committed to it. I've seen uh, childcare busing, you know, getting people, you know, to a location um, as needed if they're if they're up for that. Um, obviously, food, uh, lodging, those are all things that make it easier. And sometimes, you know, it's it's a real value to have them actually be there. Uh, and then the expenses of getting them there and taking care of them is 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 still worth making sure that they can stay focused. And Chris? Um, I will tell you, uh, having dealt with a, a huge volunteer organization that did provide <clears throat> child care, the person who is in charge of child care needs to be on staff. They need to be enormously vetted and it's no joke. Like if you're going to go down that path, you cannot make a mistake. You cannot error in any way. It, it has to be, it, it will quickly or should quickly become the most important position in all your staff, like CEO, childcare, everything else doesn't matter. It's it, it we, we hired somebody full time. They went to classes and studied how to deal with volunteers, how to vet them, how to do background checks on everybody who worked with the child care. It's enormously important. It cannot be taken lightly at all. It's more important than digital audio, Alex. Great point there, Chris. Next question. John Snyder in Reno, Nevada. Up next, what is something you implemented with a volunteer group that was a huge driver of success? Alex? The thing that I implement constantly is is being particular, <laughs> like being pushing hard to make things great because people like to be part of something that is actually working well. And they like to have something that feels like it works well, as opposed to feeling like they're in one giant cluster all the time, you know? And, and so the thing is, is that, you know, everything down to when we, um, you know, when, when we, when, again, when I was working on these, these uh, seminars, you know, we would have the number of, you know, like you would, um, you would look at the number of people holes in the, you know, the holes in the, in a, in a row and make sure that you handed out literally every person that you handed it to was the right number to go all the way across. And, and the mics were handed in a very specific way to people and the pencils under the thing were done in a very specific way. And there was something about that, that when you did it and when it was working and it was just turning, it just felt good. You know, it felt, you felt like you were part of something that was, you know, cool, you know, and, and it worked really well. And so I think that between that and a lot of just building up camaraderie with the team um, has been the two things that have been the most effective. I think, sorry, for, um, excuse me. I'm so sorry. I almost made it through the whole show without coughing on air. <laughs> <laughs> um, just depending on the size of people that you have in with the volunteers is just having a uh, comms per se. And what I mean by that, I want to say it was like some kind of messenger app that we were able to use. Cause sometimes it's really hard where a volunteer needs to get somewhere and they're lost. And that way that they can take a picture of where they are and just having everyone help like that, just looking at that event from where we didn't have it. And then when we were in the weeds of the event, it just really made it easy for everyone to be able to communicate with each other and to solve problems really quickly. So some sort of messaging system outside of text messages, because if you are working at an event, there are messages coming in from everywhere. So just for the group to have one forum where they can communicate with each other was a huge bonus and, and helped us to be really successful. Next question. Douglas Carmichael says, if you're giving trust positions like infrastructure management to volunteers, how do you guard against a rogue or undertrained volunteer? Go ahead, Bill. Well, if you're talking about equipment and things like that, there's only so much you can you can uh, manage perfectly and things will get broken and things like that. If you're talking about other press persons, though, that are more mission critical, uh, I found teaming people is the best solution. For example, we used to handle in the early days of our festival, tens of thousands of dollars worth of cash on hand. So obviously in the cash tent, um, no one person would ever be alone with that much cash at any time. So there was always groups, two or three people working together, double checking each other's work and making sure that the bags were zipped up and locked before the um, 
the guards with the armored truck came to get the cash off site. You just want to make sure that there's more than one set of eyes at every point where you have any kind of vulnerability to something going very wrong. And Alex. Yeah. And, and I think that with all of this, it, that, that I think a lot of organizations and I come back to this over and over again <laughs> as, as a, as a theme is that a lot of people think of, getting volunteers kind of like hunting and gathering. They're going to go out and get them for this job or they're going to go out and get them for this thing. Um, building a good volunteer organization is farming. You know, there's there's a lot of plowing. <laughs> there's a lot of planting seeds. There's a lot of watering. There's a lot of ongoing things that you're doing. Not It's never something that you're just doing when you need it. Uh, you're doing stuff all the time, you know, to, to make that work. And that's the way you, that, in my opinion, that's the way you kind of builds it up and it usually means that you have less rogue actors because you get to know them for a long time before they actually have of any uh, real um, impact to, to something like infrastructure. And Jesse? Yeah, uh, if an organization has a long-standing culture of utilizing volunteers, it's sometimes helpful to take a step back and say, is a volunteer the right choice for this position? Because sometimes it's a really critical position and uh, you may want to get... Uh, a seasoned expert in there. Culture plays a good role, a big role. Good point there, Jesse. Next question. Next one comes from Kenny Hampton in Greenville, Illinois. Do you find it valuable to put a sunset date on a volunteer task so the volunteer does not have the expectation of unlimited ongoing service? I have found some get comfortable and take over a task which does not allow others an opportunity. Go ahead, Chris. Kenny, I love that phrase, sunset uh, uh, sunset date or sunset clause. Um, it makes a lot of sense. W one of the problems you may run into, however, is that if you're going to put, take on volunteers and say, Hey, we want you to do this for a month or two or something like that. That means somebody has to keep track of when that two months is up because you're going to have to fill that position again. So it may cause more work, but I do think that there's a really interesting, um, it also might make it easier for people to volunteer because they're not volunteering for the rest of their life. They're volunteering for this summer or this month or something like that. And on that, um, Alex, can, can I come back tomorrow? <laughs> you know, we had a sunset of uh, today um, for for you, Chris, for you. I, I Just think me. Chris. <laughs> Just Chris. <laughs> no. Uh, I think it, it in part depends on the person and the job. I mean, uh, you know, some things we could do that with, and you want more people churning through so that you have a broader field to pick from when you have to fix a job. I mean, you know, we had a three-day festival, so I had a lot of circumstances where my A person could do Monday or, or Friday and Saturday, but couldn't do Sunday for some reason, whatever it was. Uh, so I needed that pool. Others like Peggy, the woman who did our cash, was a banker profession in her life. She understood the process and replacing her would have been a huge risk to the organization because she was truly tied in and had all the correct skills to manage something as mission critical as handing huge piles of cash and eventually making us credit card friendly. Uh, so you can't really flop her out every year because she's just too valuable in what she does for the organization. And she wouldn't be able to make the payments on her boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why did she have a bigger boat every year? She was fabulous. And, then, and you get some of those people, you just, you feel so blessed to know that you don't have to worry about that side of things, particularly the money. And there is something to be said about just letting people know how long a task should take. Just, just saying so that they won't go on and on and on. And yes, Chris, you can come back tomorrow. Well, there it is. We have completed our second hour and another great show. Thank you so much to our producers for your questions. Of course, to our panelists for all of your insights. And most importantly, to our production crew for keeping us tight and on point. And for those of you who we invite you to come back to, again tomorrow, head over to officehours.global to see the schedule. And we're going to head over into after hours now. See you later. New version of Mix Effect is up. It's pretty cool. Really? Oh, oh yeah. I need to look into that. Liberty always picks the best. I always go, I don't know if there's going to be enough time. Like, are we gonna really going to talk about this for an hour? We always do. Yes. It's a good one. It's always a good subject. I've, I've
I've ceased to worry about it. I just go, whatever Liberty sends me one day, we're good to go. All right, here we go. That's good volunteer management. 